Hi, welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Congratulations to those of you who actually showed up early enough to make sure that you got a seat. We um, made a little error, which was we got so busy over the last three days getting ready for this uh, evening that we forgot to watch the Zoom registrations yep. and uh, looked up this morning and discovered that we had twice as many people signed up as we could actually hold on a Zoom call. <laughs> Thus the panicky email late this afternoon saying, if you want to be there, <laughs> make sure that you are there early. And uh, also we are tight on time tonight because we have a hard end time that I will explain why that is in a minute. So uh, without any further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, we kind of thought we might explain a little bit about how this six-week free class came about. And it was actually in, in 2021, we were, we were sort of discussing this class that Bill and I do together called Ultimate Creative Deal Structuring Workshop and, and trying to figure out what to focus on more. I mean, we, we, we cover like eight different creative deal strategies there and negotiation and all that kind of stuff. And we said, how are we going to know where to focus? And so we came up with this idea that we would do a like a pre-class for the people who were registered and uh, kind of give them some some information up front to help them out, but also to find out what their biggest, you know, hangups were about the deal structuring class, which by the way, is coming up again, April 27th through 30th here in Cincinnati. And so we, we talked about it for weeks and weeks and weeks, figured out what to teach. And then we were like, so tickled with it <laughs> when we were done that we thought, you know, that we've got several hundred people come to the class, but there are like thousands of people who are interested in doing creative deals or are already doing them. And while our, our goal with the ultimate deal structuring, of course, is to have, you know, a few hundred people walk out of there really ready to do them. Um, and, and also to, you know, make sure that we fill up that expensive room block that we have booked at the Great Wolf Lodge here in Cincinnati. Um, we both have kind of a bigger goal of just more people knowing how to do this because it's an art that has, it, it largely got lost during all this time when interest rates just dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped. And I'm not talking about the last three years. I'm talking about since like 1999, uh, fewer and fewer people have known how to do creative deal structures because for a lot of that time, interest rates were super low and bank financing was easy to get. And that's a shame because creative deal structures are both more interesting and more fun and potentially more profitable. And also uh, they help you, they help you uh, give your money to people instead of banks, which I think Bill and I are both sort of in favor of. And so we were sort of like, you know, that community who, of people who know this, who we can talk about it with, who we can do deals with, uh, is shrinking. So let's just invite everybody to Creative Deal School, not just the couple of hundred people this year who are already signed up. Um, so that was the genesis of this. And we we didn't really get that everybody, you know, let's invite everybody. We thought that'd be like four or 500 people. Uh, it was 2,118 when I, when I logged on to Zoom today. And we didn't know we were going to have this issue with the potential limits on the Zoom calls. Um, and we also recognized uh, of, the, of the folks who signed up that you guys have a wide range of experience levels, where you are in the country, where you are in your real estate career. Um, I think we also didn't quite realize when we scheduled this back in December that the class in April was already going to be half full by the time we started. Uh, but here's, here's what we're going to be doing over the next six weeks. We're going to start on time. We're going to end on time. On time end is 825 Eastern. Uh, that's because, just if you're wondering about the weird time, uh, the Ultimate Creative Deal Structuring graduates uh, have a support call that they do every single Wednesday night, and it usually starts at 8, and they just spend an hour helping each other structure deals, and Bill and I get on there and help them structure deals. 
uh, they they actually kicked it back half an hour for us so that we could so they could attend this and and we could be here. So we want to be respectful of the fact that we got a bunch of people in this meeting who also have another meeting <laughs> at eight thirty. Uh, you will get the recordings of each meeting the next day. We are not going to have time to answer your questions in 85 minutes. So the way we are dealing with that is uh, Matt is monitoring the chat. He can answer a lot of the questions that come up about these uh, deal structures that we're going to talk about tonight. Uh, also, we have hundreds of graduates of the Ultimate Creative Deal Structuring uh, school who are signed up for this so they can help out in the chat hint hint ultimate graduates when you see a question you're like I know the answer to that because I went to the class uh, please do answer it and hopefully you got the memo that we have added a separate question and answer session at noon eastern time each Thursday after the class in case you didn't get it it's one registration link to sign up for all six of these Thursday Q&A calls, and Bev is putting that link in the chat right now. So for those of you who are brand new to Creative Deals, or maybe you've done like one kind and you're not familiar with all the other kinds there are, I just want to let you know that there will be moments during this six weeks, I don't know, it might be all the moments, I don't know, during the next six weeks, where you just kind of feel hopelessly lost. You just you just kind of feel like, I, I don't understand what's going on. Um, that is completely normal when you are a new investor. In fact, I would say that it is good if you feel lost at least some of the time. We all, all of us, me, Bill, Matt, everybody who's doing it felt that way at the beginning about certain things. And if you... If you feel that way, that is your opportunity to know that you need to learn more about whatever it was you were lost about. So stick with it. Don't leave because you're like, I'm, too, I'm not smart enough to get this. No, no, nobody's born understanding creative deal structuring. Every term that you don't understand uh, if if somebody says, uh, well, I did a sub two and it was uh, also an owner carry back 0%. Write it down. We've got these Q and A times for you to answer to to ask questions about things like that. Put it in the chat. Somebody will answer it for you. Uh, so you've got multiple opportunities to learn as much as you can over these next six weeks. Also, if you have not taken Ultimate Creative Deal Structuring, I would strongly suggest that you consider that. It's very cheap right now. It's not going to be cheap in ten days. Uh, and you can learn more about it at billandkimcook.com. So a couple of quick introductions. My name is Vina Jones-Cox. I am in the Cincinnati area. I wholesale properties. I provide rental housing. I do lease options and repair for equity deals. I also own short-term rentals. I am a real estate business owner. I have a staff of five people who do a lot of the kind of day-to-day legwork in my business. Uh, leaving me free to do the stuff I like and I'm good at, which is mostly negotiation, marketing, and creative deal structuring. My goal is to do two or three deals every month. Uh, I did my first creative deal back in 1990, and I've done, it's probably more like 1,200 total deals at this point. And I'm very, very involved, as many of you know, with uh, uh, real estate investors associations, including, uh, boy, it's not Central Ohio Real Estate Entrepreneurs anymore. It's now called Community of Real Estate Entrepreneurs, still CORE, and uh, RE of Greater Cincinnati and the OREA Convention and a lot of, uh, do a lot of work with a lot of local real estate associations. Uh, Bill is, yes, a, is a self-described, this is not, this is not, something I put on him, mom and pop landlord, by which he meant rental housing provider. Uh, he's got about 30 <laughs> years of creative deal experience. He did actually become an ender, if you know what that is. That's a person who has so much passive cash flow that they never need to do another deal, never need to work another day in their life. Uh, around 2015, and then had the brilliant idea that because the market was going to crash in 2018, uh, he was going to sell most of those rental properties, you know, at the top of the market. 
and sell them creatively. So he still had cash flow. And his goal for 2023 is to reacquire some properties by three midterm rentals and a personal residence in Florida, all using the same strategies we're going to talk about. Yep. And one of the really great things about tonight you're going to see is where Veen and I, we sing in harmony together. Um, a lot of what we do is very similar, but there's a lot that we do that, that, that's different. Um, and it's going to be really interesting to watch that at work where Vina is going to do more deals than I do in a given year. Um, she works in a mortgage state. I work in a deed of trust state. So it's really good. this is going to be a lot of fun to see different takes on how we do similar things. Yeah, now uh, there is a set of things that we absolutely 100% agree on. One is it doesn't matter what the market is. There are always creative deals. They are always all around you. You may not know how to see them right now, but they are there. Uh, we also believe that anybody can do them. There's there's no one that none of you are, are actually too dumb <laughs> to understand and do real estate deals. I mean, Bill does them. So, I mean, I think that proves something right there. And I can hear you. We also, I can hear you. We also are going to, um, you're going to hear a lot about ethics in these conversations because unfortunately there's some people out there teaching creative deals in a way that the two, the two of us and many other people partly think is unethical. So in this session, we're going to talk about the 2023 market and what factors are affecting this idea that this is like the best year we've seen in a decade to get out there and start getting into the creative deal business. We're going to share the four that we think are going to be most useful to you. And at the end, we're going to give away a door prize, which is a course that I created called how to do subject to legally, ethically, and profitably. That is a $297 value. It's going to be randomly drawn from whoever is still here at 825. Those of you who are graduates and attendees, let me head this question off right now. Uh, we're going to cover four the, the four strategies that we think are the best. We're going to get a dozen emails tomorrow that say, where can I find the paperwork for that? It's in your class materials. Please go reference your giant manual and your uh, online folder full of forms and contracts before you ask that question. So uh, the market. <clears throat> so the reality is, Every real estate market has opportunities and challenges. For instance, 2009 market. A lot of people will say, man, that was the worst market. I mean, uh, it was really hard to get bank loans and, and all the hard money lenders had gone out of business. And even if you got a house, nobody wanted to buy it. And all my, all my rents went down by 10 to 30%. But also... That was a year when you could buy properties for literally 20 or 30 cents on the dollar. There were desperate sellers everywhere. You could get seller financing without hardly even asking. There was a ton of private financing available because people had pulled their money out of the stock market and it was sitting in a bank account somewhere uh, doing nothing. On the other hand, a lot of people would say, man, I wish I wish it was still 2021 because rents were high and they were going up 10% every year and every house you wanted to sell sold in like three days and it didn't seem to matter what you were asking. It sold over asking price. Remember that? Interest rates were super low. But on the other hand, it was also hard to find discounted properties and even sellers who were motivated in the sense that they really did need to sell weren't all that motivated because they had 50 investors knocking on their doors waiting to pay them more than the house was worth. Um, and I'd like to remind you that there was an eviction moratorium for most of that year. That wasn't great. So every opportunity, every market has opportunities and challenges. In 2023, we've got a market that is continuing to change from super hot to stagnant and even in some areas already starting to decline longer and longer and longer days on market for properties that are for sale. There's a huge number of properties right now, way more than average that are falling out of contract, meaning they go pending and then they come back on the market because the buyer got cold feet or couldn't qualify for the loan. 
at the higher interest rate. Uh, rents are stagnant or declining in most areas. And if that's not your area yet, it will be soon. Vacancy rates are increasing. Interest rates are continuing to go up. We're, uh, the Fed has basically said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to have a recession. I mean, they, they've, stopped, they've stopped talking about soft landings. And there is even less on market inventory than there was a year ago, not because stuff is selling really fast, but because sellers aren't putting their houses on the market. And the reason they're not putting their, seller, their houses on the market is because they can't afford the move up house at 7% when they've got a two and a half percent loan on the house they live in now. They're literally trapped by the fact that they've got low interest rates. But at the same time, I can tell you from both my own experience and from talking to investors around the country that all of the kind of dumb cash offers, you know, all the, all the billions of wholesalers who didn't quite know what they're doing, going out and making offers that are too high on the kind of properties we usually wanna buy, it has fallen away drastically and will continue to do so. Uh, we happen to have 70% of the country right now who has interest rates on their houses under 4%, which is going to come into play when we talk about our first strategy. Foreclosures and loan defaults are on the rise, which creates a whole new class of motivated seller. And we also have a bunch of sellers who are who are trapped in this idea of, but I should be able to get $350,000 because my neighbor sold for $350,000 and that was only a year ago. You might think that's a challenge, but that's actually an opportunity if you know how to do creative financing. Um, also, we're seeing a record number of housing providers who are just, they're either fed up with all the interference in their business, or they're just getting older and they're selling. So this is good for creative buyers because more sellers in trouble and less competition means more sellers who are open to talking terms instead of cash. Taking over two and a half to 5% loans, when you know how to do that, make it possible for you to buy a property even at full price in most places and still make it cash flow. So that seller who wants full price, you might be able to give it to them. Uh, sellers who want too much can get too much and retiring rental housing providers, especially if they've owned their rentals for 30 years, they have a tax problem. If they sell, they're going to pay out the wazoo for taxes, and we can actually keep them from paying taxes at all with at least one of our strategies. So with that, our number one pick for the strategy you need to know in 2023 is buying property subject to the existing loan. That all of the all of the signs are there that this is going to be the the strategy that you most often use, and that you that you will have a lot of opportunity to profit from. So, just a quick review for those of you who are super new: a subject to deal. That's how we shorten up buying property subject to the existing loan. Is when the seller agrees to actually deed you the property. Like you're going to own the property if you're buying it subject to, which means you have all the rights and responsibilities of any owner, but he's deeding it to you without you paying off the existing note and without the mortgage being released. So of course, the rest of the agreement is you agree that after the closing, you will make the seller's payments for them. So Notes still in their name, mortgage is still on the property, you're going to make the payments going forward. Why is this so awesome in today's market? Well, number one, so many low interest rate mortgages to take over. I mean, do the math on what a quarter million dollar house will cost you per month at current rates of for investors getting up to 8% versus 4% for 
Creative financing is mostly a cash flow game and you get a lot more cash flow at four than you do at eight, which means you can pay more for the house. A lot of people who have bought their properties in the last couple of years because the market's kind of stagnating and because they maybe only put 3% down are finding it hard if they need to sell to sell traditionally, pay off the mortgage, pay the agent, uh, pay the transfer taxes, pay the deed prep, like literally they do the math and they're going to have to bring money to the closing to sell their properties. Unless of course they sell it to you off market, in which case at the very least, they don't have to pay to sell their house. And at best, they might actually get a little money that they wouldn't get selling traditionally. Um, there's a lot of folks in default on their mortgages right now. The 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 60 day this uh, sorry six month default rate on FHA loans, in other words, people who defaulted in the first six months, is uh, as high. It it is higher now than it has been since 2012, and that's just one of the indicators that there's a lot of people in trouble with their mortgages who might let you buy their house, catch up their payments and fix their credit for them by making their payments. So we're gonna learn by example today. And I'm gonna give you an example of a property that I closed on uh, in December, I believe. And it was funny because when I showed this deal to Bill, his first reaction was, what? <laughs> why, why would you buy this house? Because it's not your it's not your traditional pretty house subject to kind of deal. It's a three bedroom, two bath house. It's in a C class rental area. It's only worth about one twenty five, completely fixed up, and it honestly ne needed about sixty thousand dollars worth of work to get to that one hundred and twenty five thousand dollar value. I mean, you can just see from the exterior pictures, you can probably see what. $25,000 worth of work. This house would rent for $1,000 a month fixed up. So after $60,000 in work, it would rent for $1,000 a month. So when you are approaching any potential creative deal, you want to start with the seller. You don't want to start with, okay, so how should I buy this? You want to start with the seller and what the seller situation was. So I'll, I'll tell you what that was. Uh, this seller was 82. Uh, he had lived in the house for, I guess my little thingy went over the thing. Um, he had lived in the house for over 30 years. He already knew where he was going when he sold the house, which was to move to Colorado to move in with his new girlfriend that he had met apparently online. His biggest concern other than being able to sell the house in three weeks and drive to Colorado was that he did not want to do any of these, you know, fairly massive repairs and clean out that the house needed to be, uh, needed to have. Uh, he had refinanced the property in 2021. So he still had over 20, it, almost 29 years left on the loan, but the loan had a $32,000 balance. He got that all out in cash because it, he didn't know anything when he refinanced it. The interest rate is 2.875%. And the total principal interest tax and insurance payment are, is only uh, $263 a month. Now, he went, by the time he called me, he, he got a postcard from me. And he called me and he said, look, I've already got a $35,000 cash offer on the house. So I'm just seeing if you can do better. So I went out and looked at it and I thought, man, $35,000 cash is actually way too much to offer on this house. So I offered him $36,000, but not cash. It was $36,000 subject to that loan of his. The contract said, and he did, that he was going to pay for the deed preparation and the transfer taxes and all the things that sellers typically pay for. The contract said we will close in two and a half weeks so that you know you're cleanly going to be able to get in your U-Haul, get in your U-Haul and go meet with your girlfriend. Now, what baffled Bill about this, I think, is 
It's a C neighborhood rental and it's $60,000 from actually being a nice rental. So in, in, in bill world, like wrong neighborhood, wrong amount of work to do. Now, the thing is, I don't want to own rentals in C neighborhoods anymore. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with them. And I, I spent many, 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 many years being a housing provider in those C neighborhoods. But as I have gotten more mature, um, I have decided that I like B and B plus neighborhoods better. So when I see a deal in an area like this, I try to pass it on to someone who is very excited about having such a property. So I did not fix it. I am not renting it. What I did with the property was I did what's called wrapping the subject to. I kept the subject to in place and I, I called one of the rental housing providers I know who does lots of rehab. And I said, I will sell you the house for $45,000. I'm going to need $9,000 down, but then I will give you a 30 year fully amortizing loan at 8% interest. Now, do you think a 30 year fully amortizing loan at 8% interest in today's market is pretty attractive? You know, no qualifying. Uh, you could do it in your self-directed IRA if you wanted to. Do you think anybody might want to take me up on an offer like that if it was the house they liked in a neighborhood they liked? Because I can tell you it only took one phone call to sell this deal. He is making me monthly payments of $394. So without doing any work to it, I got a $5,000 cash profit up front because I paid four down and I got nine down. Four was the difference between the 32 he owed and the 36 I agreed to pay. I have $40,000 in what's called wrap equity, meaning I, I owed, in, back in December, this number's changed, but I owed the bank 32,000 and he owes me 36. So if he were to pay off tomorrow, which I hope he does not, I would get another $4,000 right away, right? I have monthly net cash flow of $164 a month on a property that I saw one time when I went to look, for, look at it with the seller. I will never see it again. I will get that cash flow for the next 30 years. And if he does pay it off before 30 years is up, I will get another lump sum of cash at that time. So. Bill, the reason you'd want to do this deal is because you don't have to do the repairs. You don't have to manage the folks who live there. Somebody else is willing to do that, and they're willing to pay you $164 a month in net cash flow for 30 years. And that's a lesson learned. <laughs> that is a lesson learned. So lessons from this deal. Uh, first of all, the correct cash price. Those of you who are used to wholesaling properties or retailing properties did the math and you said, well, wait, 70% of 125 minus 60 is only 27. And also if I wanted to wholesale it, I need to subtract another five, $10,000. So, um, I could really only pay 18,000 for the house. How in the world did you outbid that $35,000 cash offer at 36? That's an important lesson if you're gonna do creative strategies. If you're getting terms, you can give terms. If you are getting terms, you can almost always pay more and often a lot more than the folks who are paying cash or even getting a bank loan. We're actually going to talk more about that next week, about how do you figure out what you can pay when it is a creative deal. Second lesson is it's way easier to put together creative deals when you kind of understand the whole story of the seller. Because I just sat there in his, in his living room and I said, all right, you've got an offer for $35. I'll give you $1,000 more than that. And I'll take care of your payments after the closing. And yes, you can leave everything that you don't want. You can just move on. 
I mean, really your $35,000 cash offer is only going to net you about $2,000 by the time you've paid off your mortgage, paid your closing costs. This is going to net you $1,000 more. Guarantee it. And he thought that was pretty cool. Uh, lesson number three is there is a lot of talk out on the internet right now about wholesaling subject twos. The way I just described where you stay in the middle is the only ethical way to do that. It is not, in my opinion or Bill's opinion, ethical to simply assign your subject to contract for cash and step away for reasons that if you want to know them, you can come on the call tomorrow at noon Eastern time and ask me that question and I will be happy to describe it to you in detail. The inside, the insight of this is if my buyer stops paying me, which he won't do. He's a very experienced buyer. I've sold to him before. I've financed deals to him before. I will still pay the seller's payment. And I will fix it with my buyer. I will foreclose on my buyer if I have to. Or I will just get it deeded over to me. The seller will never see a blip on his credit report. The seller will never get anything other than what I promised him he was going to get. So that is our number one pick, buying subject to the existing loan. The problem is it doesn't work all the time because not every house has an existing loan. Something like 25% of the properties in the United States are free and clear. So if the only tool you have in your tool bag is buying subject to, uh, you're going to miss out on 25% of deals you see because you cannot buy those subject to the existing loan because there is no loan. So our number two pick is what is often called a seller carry back mortgage or an owner mortgage, or there's, there's a lot of different names for it, but it's all the same thing. This is when the seller agrees to sell you the property. You're going to get the deed. You are the legal owner after the closing. You have all the rights and responsibilities of an owner, but the seller agrees to accept all or part of his purchase price in payments at a certain interest rate that you agree on that doesn't have to be market rate and over a certain time frame that you agree on. So one way to think of this is that the seller becomes the bank. That's not actually accurate because what banks do is they like give you money and you, well, they send money to the closing and you use their money to buy somebody else's house. And in this case, what's happening is the seller is bringing the deed to the closing and he's accepting a note, which is the promise to pay. I'm going to pay you X number of payments for Y months instead of all cash. But like a bank, he has a note and he has a mortgage. So if you were to not pay, he's got a mortgage against the property, which would allow him to institute a foreclosure, take over. Um, uh, uh, auction the property off. And if he was the winning, better take it back. Now, again, 85 minutes is such a challenge. No seller is going to want to hear that. No seller is going to be excited when you say, well, if I don't pay you, you can foreclose on me because they don't know how to do that. They don't want to be somebody who's foreclosing on somebody. There's actually a way to set up the deal so that the seller does not have to foreclose if you don't make payments. And maybe that would be a good topic for tomorrow. We cover that at uh, Ultimate Creative Deal Structuring Workshop, and it takes like an hour and a half to cover how that works. So it's a really good stru uh, structure when there's no mortgage. And important to remember, as you see this example, that sellers are not banks. They're not selling so that they can get some market interest rate on their note. In fact, as you're about to see, some of them don't maybe need any interest at all. So uh, this next example is not going to be one that Bill or I did. It is going to be one that one of our uh, ultimate graduates and the gal who actually hosts that Wednesday night weekly support call for ultimate graduates 
did. Her name is Anita Johnson. She has been a rental housing provider for over two decades, and she is a recent ex-corporate drone, <laughs> having retired from her corporate job, uh, gosh, just about a month ago now. So yay, Anita. Um, Bev, if we could get Anita on the screen as if she were a panelist so that everybody could see her, that would be fantastic. Now, I'm going to have Anita kind of talk you through this deal because it was her very first seller carryback. She, she'd always done things with banks prior to this. And um, Anita, tell us, tell us a little bit about the property itself. Sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Vina, for having me on. So um, as uh, Vina mentioned, this was my very first 100% uh, seller held uh, or seller carry back deal. And I heard about it on our RIA Friday morning, have some wants. Um, the seller was another investor who came on and said, hey, I have this property and uh, essentially I'm looking to sell it. And uh, I would be willing to kind of consider some financing, right? Well, he, he said that after a little bit of harassment. After a little, Nina. yes. <laughs> he said, I want to sell it. And I said, yes, would you he did. financing? He said, I just want to sell it. <laughs> um, so basically, uh, I called him up and uh, we had a conversation over the phone. And then we set an appointment to go see the property. And when I saw the property, uh, my initial thoughts were, okay, it's, it needs some repairs, okay? Uh, we knew at the outset um, that the rent uh, at that time, there was a, a tenant there, was $850, but that we could probably get more in rents because it wasn't quite at market rent, okay? And this $25,000 that you see, that is the amount that was later determined as needed um, based on a full-blown house inspection, because anytime I'm going to uh, buy a property and I plan to hold it long-term, I'm going to have a full-blown inspection done. Um, and so to fully stabilize it, the repairs were roughly about $25,000. Um, next screen. So um, this seller had actually purchased this property um, not even a full year earlier. Um, he had purchased it um, thinking that he wanted to do rentals. And then as he learned more about other avenues within real estate investing, he later decided, uh, I'm not quite sure if I really want to do rentals. And so therefore he offered to sell it and his initial asking price was $90,000. Um, now, as Bina mentioned, <laughs> uh, this seller, when he presented it on the call, he wanted to just sell it. Um, but then he had a little bit of coercion there uh, to say, hey, uh, maybe financing it might be a good idea. And so essentially, he and I, we spent a lot of time uh, talking about this deal, um, talking about why seller financing might be right, and most importantly, what were the terms, okay? And so we both knew that I could not give him a cash offer because as you can see here, the typical cash formula uh, would put me at about 34, five. About okay? half what he and paid for it. Is less than half, yes, of what he, uh, what he paid for it. And so what I offered him was $68,000 because keep in mind, he had purchased it less than a year ago, didn't really want to sell it for less than what he had bought it for. So to meet that need and to still also be able to figure out how to manage these repairs, I offered him this uh, payment, $326.21 for 150 months. And then basically on the 151st month, you'll have a balloon. Okay, of nineteen thousand sixty eight dollars and fifty cents. All right. Now, uh, that balloon payment, uh, as you can see here, uh, again, comes out to nineteen thousand sixty eight fifty because I'm giving him one hundred and fifty payments of three hundred twenty six dollars and twenty one cents. So, again, the seller here is uh, the, this is the offer I made to him uh, to give him monthly payments and so that he wouldn't carry it as payments 
for so long, he, he requested, hey, can we maybe do some sort of balloon so that it doesn't, you know, we don't have to pay 326.21 for the entire until it's fully paid. Yeah, okay? no, and Anita, at this point, I think we should quiz the audience because they see the math. They see it. 150 payments of 326.21 is 48.931. Purchase price is 68. Balloon is 90, 1906.8.50. What's the interest rate on this loan? Audience? I see it in the chat. Folks got it right. Zero <laughs> percent. Yep. So sellers will do deals like this. Okay. Um, and that is, you know, the total of what I'm paying is the 68,000. Um, I'm just paying the seller that amount uh, over time. So one could say I badly overpaid for it. But if you think about those payments per month, which are all going towards principal pay down, uh, and the fact that I'm keeping it as a long-term rental. So as long as the cash flow makes sense, doesn't matter what I'm paying. Now, I did have one small problem though, <laughs> the repairs. So I knew I needed to fund these repairs, right? So how did I fund those repairs? I bought in another uh, investor who is also an ultimate graduate. And so, um, and so didn't have a, to have, didn't have to have a wrap mortgage explained to her. <laughs> yes. Someone who uh, fully understood what a wrap note in mortgage was, and they became my private lender, um, loaning me the $25,000 that I needed. So not only do I have a property that um, the seller financed for me, but I also was able to get the repairs financed. So my total payment, which includes the underlying to the seller of the 326.21, my total payment across both is $380.70. So still cash flows for me, and it gives the private lender a huge return of about 18%. Now that, that, that statement you just made is that this is one of those moments when a lot of people are going, I am not following how the interest rate is 5%, but she's getting 18% return somehow. So I'm going to request that Matt post the video about how wrap mortgages work because it's an out that that's would be an hour long explanation. And we talk about it ultimate. It's more like two hours because we're, we're actually trying to go through the documents and everything. Um, and you guys should grab that link so that you can watch the video later so that you can understand why a 5% interest rate loan can be an 18% return to the lender because that is a great way to fund your uh, repairs, your repair costs. Absolutely. Not, not and once I learned rate. about it, I thought, wow, this is just awesome. Yeah. And, so, and yeah, so story for another day maybe April 28th, 2023 in Cincinnati, which is the day we're going to cover this at Ultimate. Um, the, the whole reason, the, those of you who are, who've been before and you're like, wasn't it, wasn't it three days? Yeah. The reason it's now four is so that we can cover wrap mortgages. We can do some, you know, sitting down and working through problems together. Uh, things that like deals like this that require more than one structure to completely do no money down. We'll have time to do all that stuff. So what the deal looks like now. Yeah. So right now uh, there is a new tenant in it. The rate, the rent has been increased. Um, property has been fully stabilized. Um, and you'll see here, you know, you take the rents and then what my payments are, which include both loans taxes and insurance. And then of course, you know, you always want to take out the 20% uh, maintenance, vacancy and reserves. But even with that, I have a really good cash flow situation on a property mm -hmm. that I'm holding. Yes. And again, I'm going to, I'm going to say that we're going to get more into detail about what the actual, actual, actual cash flow looks like and, and therefore what you can offer on a property next week. Uh, because it deserves its own class. Because the biggest question, actually, Anita, I don't know how many times you asked this question. 
a lot is, is okay, but I don't understand if it's a creative deal, how much more can I pay? <laughs> and the answer is it depends. And that's what we're going to spend 85 minutes on next week. So lessons you learned. Yeah. The lessons for me was that um, just the continuation of building uh, relationships with folks. And anytime that you hear someone has a problem that they need solved um, and listening to their uncomfortable situation, um, make the offer. Um, even if it is different than what the seller actually says that they want. Again, in this case, the seller originally wanted 90, um, but I couldn't make him an offer of 90. Um, and then sellers don't really need big down payments and huge interest rates, okay? What they really need and what our job really is uh, as real estate investors is to help them uh, with solutions, to come up with solutions that truly help uh, them and that's a win for everyone. Um, mm -hmm. So too many people don't make creative offers to sellers because the, in their heads, they go, oh, they're not going to take that. They're not going to take zero money down. They're not going to take 68 when they were asking for 90. They're not going to take 326 a month when the rent is 850 a month. And you also have a whole story about how you kind of sat through and worked through the numbers with him and said, yeah, it, you're not getting 850 a month though, because <laughs> you're Correct. paying the taxes, you're paying the insurance, you're paying, the, you're really getting more like 326 a month. So this is the same, only you don't have to own a house you don't want to own anymore. Absolutely. So congratulations, Anita. Thank you. It's a really spectacular deal, especially for a first, first fully creative finance deal. That's, that's really With amazing. With more than one structure. Yes. It was yes. Very interesting, but I learned a lot. Yes. Awesome. Yes. So thank you for presenting you. and congratulations. So we are up to our third pick for 2023. And this was this is one that maybe you all are not as familiar with. I mean, most people have heard of owner carry back mortgages. Most people have heard of subject twos. But if you have heard of lease options, it's probably because you have heard of selling properties on lease option more than you have about controlling properties on lease option. But this having this tool added to your tool bag, lets you make some deals that you literally just can't make with any of the other structures. So for the really new people, let's just quickly talk about what a lease option is. When you're lease, leasing a property with an option to buy, you're not actually buying the property. You're doing exactly what it sounds like. You're getting a lease and you're getting a right to buy in the future. So you're not buying, you're controlling without owning. So you've made a deal that you're going to pay X dollars a month in rent. You know what that rent is and you know what it is every month for the entire term of the lease option. Normally when you negotiate even a 10 or 20 year lease option, you set the rent now. You say that my rent every month is going to be X dollars. And you also set the price at which you are going to buy it now. So here's an interesting thing just to ponder for a minute. If I want to sell you my $200,000 house for half a million dollars, and you're signing an agreement now to buy it for half a million dollars, but you have 30 years to do that, and in the meantime, the monthly payment lets you cash flow the property. Do you really care that you agreed to pay half a million dollars for a house that's worth less than half that? Because you don't have to buy it right now, right? In fact, you don't have to buy it ever if you don't want to buy it under an option to buy. So the reason that these are, because we, we really struggled over which of the eight things did we think were best for 2023. Um, why did lease options make the cut? Well, part of the reason is this thing that we're all experiencing where sellers want the same price they could have gotten when interest rates were half what they are now. Like they just want more for their house than the, pay the payments that you would have coming in will support with the new interest rates. You know, you can 
negotiate whatever rent you want. There's no interest rate here. If they agree to $1,000 a month and your house payment, if you bought the house would be $2,000 a month, that, that's fine. You can do that. This is especially true for those of you who want to buy apartments. My gosh, the apartment market has just ground to a halt because of all the sellers who still think they can sell at a three cap like they could have last year, even though interest rates are now like twice as high as that. Well, really for apartments, they're more than twice as high as the, as the cap rate. So if somebody were to buy it at a three cap, they would literally lose money if they had to go get a bank loan. So those sellers who are just obsessed with their price, this structure is a really good way to make, to go ahead and offer them their price, but still have the property make money because you're offering them a payment that you can't get from a bank. So they can sell for last year's price. Heck, they can sell for next year's price, you know, if they, if they're willing to let you have this option for long enough. The other kind of piece of this is that the baby boomer rental owners, the people who are now in their seventies, eighties are, I, 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 Bill, you and I were talking about this the other day. There seem to be more boomer rental housing owners trying to sell right now than I have ever seen. So Bill's nodding. So I guess he agrees. I do agree. <laughs> the thing is, what is stopping them from selling? Like they'll call you and they'll be like, I need to sell this property because I can't manage it anymore. And I haven't raised the rents for 15 years. And I can't even get over there because my, my, my hips were replaced. And um, okay, well, I'd like to buy it from you. Well, but my accountant said I was going to have to pay $100,000 in capital gains taxes if I sold it. And these are people who've spent their entire lives avoiding taxes. Some of you are laughing because you're like, oh, poor you. If you're paying 100000 in taxes, that means you made 400000 Poor you. You got to understand their mindsets. They really, really, like they will continue to own a property they don't want until they die before they will pay taxes on it. This is the only strategy of the eight strategies where they can completely 100% avoid ever paying those capital gains taxes. Now, the way they avoid it is they die before you exercise the option. Because as long as they haven't actually sold it, there's no capital gains tax due, right? By the way, this makes boomers the most, most intelligent generation of all the generations. Because they don't want to pay taxes? Yes. <laughs> okay. And they know how not to do it. So this next deal is not, it's not quite a, it's not a boomer situation. It's not somebody trying not to pay taxes situation, but it was still the best fit for the deal. And you're going to see why. And once again, this is not a deal that Bill and I did. This is a deal that uh, one of our ultimate grads did. Her name is Michelle Clayton. She is a stay-at-home mother of three. She's been wholesaling and providing rental housing since 2007, and she is the co-leader of the uh, Creative Finance Focus Group at RIA GC and CoRE that meets once a month to talk about guess what. So, Michelle, welcome. Hello. Thank you. Hi. Uh, can we get her up as a presenter, Bev? So let's talk first about this deal because... It, it's just, it's, it's, it's just the property itself is really interesting. Sure. Um, well, this particular house, it is in a community um, that is a little um, lake community nearby Cincinnati. And I had actually never heard of it. So I didn't know a lot about the community. It was just tucked away there um, across the border in Indiana. And um, this particular house uh, it was on a dead end street where you could just barely get a glimpse of the lake and this neighborhood itself, what was really peculiar about it is be, it had the attraction of the lake and all the HOA amenities that went along with the lake community, but at the same time, where you were located within the community greatly changed the value of the property that you had and then also um, 
you know, the size of the house and features and all that stuff. So this particular house was a three bedroom, two bath house, 2000 square feet. Um, the hardest thing with this particular house because of the nature of the community is I had no idea what the value was. I didn't know the neighborhood. And then there was a wide range from very moderate houses uh, around the 130 range, all the way up to houses over a million dollars, depending on all the variables with the lake community. And um, so I was very nervous to figure out any kind of ARV. And then, but overall, this house was in really good condition. The homeowner, she um, had just bought the house and then decided she wanted to moved to a different area uh, closer to town in her job and everything. And so she um, was trying to sell the house right away, right after buying it, which obviously is hard to do. Um, she financially was fine, but she um, you know, didn't wanna lose money too much on the house. And then also we're, she didn't have the best realtor, so it wasn't selling listed it for a thousand instead of 2000 square feet. She had just bought it. So it was a lot of weird variables for her to try to sell the house. Um, with this, basically what I ended up working out with her is I tried different, um, thought about the different strategies I could use, but what made most sense for her and I in this situation is I agreed to lease the property from her for $790 per month. That would cover her PITI and HOA, um, just the basic minimum expenses she had with the property. And then I would take care of the property and dealing with any renters. She was completely paranoid with dealing with tenants so that she didn't want to go that route for herself. Um, and then I did agree that I would buy the property for um, pretty much her full asking price, $145,000. Um, but I set it out for a four year timeline is what I had set it out for that we got to agree on. So it was far enough out that I felt comfortable, but not so far out that she was feeling uncomfortable being stuck with the house for a long term. So again, why I chose that route is it's something that she felt comfortable with. She wasn't really comfortable with subject to taking over a mortgage or um, land contract, but with the lease option that was close enough to what she was familiar with that she felt comfortable with it. And it also made me more comfortable because I truly had no clue what the house was worth. I could, I, 145 sounded reasonable. She had just paid that and gotten financed for that. So it sounded like a reasonable value to me, but beyond that, I had no idea. And here's where it gets complicated. <laughs> so, so let me, let me just remind everybody who's watching that three slides back, we said that the market rent on this house was 1345 because there, there was only a brief period where you actually got 1345. So deal closes, you did the title search, did all your due diligence that we're going to talk about in week six. And then Yes. So my initial plan was to offer for sale on lease option and to basically do a sandwich lease option. But while I was marketing it for rent, an insurance company reached out to me and wanted to place a family that had a house fire. And I agreed to work with them since I had four years to work with the house. So I agreed to work with them. My net in my pocket after their payment and what I had to pay was 1035 per month. And that family ended up staying there about 10 months. So that was the ballpark $10,530. So the, the, the way she came up with 1035 is her outgoing payment, rent payment, mm -hmm. 790. And then uh, the incoming payment from the insurance company now was $1,800 a month. And this was my typo here. That should be 10, yeah. 50, and there was 10, a half month in there too. So, okay. So, <laughs> so then they moved out and <laughs> so they moved out again, I was going to sell it on lease option. And I did find a couple that was interested in buying the house. They put $5,000 down and were paying the monthly payments of 1325 per month. Um, 
And then the wife lost her job with COVID and they probably had some other issues going on as a result of that. And they decided to walk away from the house and find a cheaper place to live. Um, so as a result of that, it was an option fee they paid the $5,000. I got to keep that. And then in the meantime, while they had lived there for about two years, I netted $605 a month between the, what I received and what I had to pay in rent. And so that was the 19,000 and such. So eventually they were moving out The my option on the property was coming close to an end by that point. And so, um, or no, I was offering it for rent again. I had a little over a year. Um, so I put it back on the market and then another insurance company reached out to me again. We agreed on 1650 per month. And the net rent to me was $9,640 over that time. All right. And then step four, my last step of making money, um, my option was coming to an end and those people were moving out. Their house was fixed. They moved out. And um, I ended up finding a buyer for the house that offered $170,000 as is. And so I netted um, the difference between the 170 versus the 145 um, gave me $25,000 paid at closing for a release of my option because they technically bought it from the owner, not me. Because you never did own this house. Never. In, in the whole four years, you never exercised the option. You never went to the bank. You never got financing. And in case folks were not able to add the numbers at the bottoms of all those slides, that's $64,510 in profit on a house you didn't put any money down on, spent $100 getting rent ready, didn't go to a bank and qualify for, you never, you never owned it. And somehow you made $64,000 in four years. I was very happy. So, so how much did it stress you out that you didn't own this house? Oh, no, that was fine. <laughs> <laughs> that, I, I was okay. So it worked out. Okay. So lessons learned. So from this, um, you know, I had the reference in my head when I was negotiating with her the different potential creative deal structures that I could use and figure out the pros and cons in this situation and ultimately what also worked for the seller. Um, so I was solving her problem where she didn't have to worry about the house anymore, the mortgage on the house or managing the house. Cause like I said, she was terrified of the idea of dealing with renters. She didn't want to go that route. Um, so I basically solved her problem and then control of a property can be just as good um, as long as you're covering everything that's important to you. So it doesn't have to be with ownership. So great deal. That was your first lease option, by the way, right? Where you were buying on lease option. Yes. Worked out. Okay. <laughs> I I'm be happy to do it again. <laughs> you were, you were, you were glad that you had that tool to reach into the bag when they said, no, not comfortable with the subject too. Yes. So yay, Michelle, congratulations. And thank you for presenting tonight. Thank you. Thanks. All right. So our last pick for 2023 is gets away from the whole seller financing idea and into the idea of creative partnerships. This is actually Bill's deal and he's going to take over the slides here in a moment, which means he's got his slides up and ready to click that button. But just again, just a quick review of what a partnership is versus what a private lender is. Partners are people who have money to contribute to the deal or they might have they might be contributing work to the deal or knowledge to the deal but because of their contribution they own part of the deal 
They don't just have like a lien against it. They actually are co-owners with you in some way. Private lenders have liens on your property. Partners have ownership interests. And listen, partnerships can be structured in a lot of ways. I think that's our week. So we got week three or four. We're going to talk about different forms of creative partnerships and private lending. Partners are really, really good for bringing things to your deal that you don't have or, or doing things in your deal that you don't want to do. Don't get stuck in your head with the idea that every partnership is one person brings the money and the other person brings the knowledge and the work and everybody splits things evenly because that is just not always true. So why do we like partnerships in this year? There's a lot of experienced investors out there who have sold out in the last three years because the market was high, because they were frustrated with the interference from the government, or just because they're aging. And because of that, they're sitting on a lot of cash and also a lot of knowledge that they're willing to share with people who bring a good deal and are willing to do the work. Because particularly these older, more experienced investors, they're, they're kind of done with the work part. They just want to invest and share their knowledge and their money. So Bill's deal... I'm going to stop my share Bill so you can deal pick. and I'm going to share my screen. And I would like to point out that it is 805, Bill. I you have been, I've been texting about this. You have been absolutely positively phenomenal. I just have to let you know that phenomenal. So the first thing is I promised to do, I talked to Pete Fortunato today and he is out of the hospital and um, he's at home. And he's doing really well. And he's received hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of uh, messages and emails and text messages and everything under the sun. And it's made a huge difference in his life. And he just wanted, he said, please tell everybody, thank you for everything they've done and all the good wishes. So thank you to the whole community. We really appreciate it because we love Pete very much. So we want to talk about creative deal partnering. And as you just heard Venus say, this is when a lender is not a lender. And a lender, you know, they, they are a lender, but they're also getting part of the deal. And that's what makes it special and different. And there's uh, different times you're going to use this. And the main time I've used creative partnering is when I'm using a technique that I've never used before. Not so much when I'm just needing a loan, but I can do it that way. But when I'm using a technique that's brand new to me, I want somebody looking over my shoulder. So here's a good example of that. Um, this is a deal that we did a number of years ago. And when I did this deal, it was called a Lonnie deal, but I had no money to do this deal with, and I had no know-how. I did not know how to make this deal work. So I had to find some way to make it work. And we were getting, this is back in 2008, when we were going through the Great Recession, and Kim and I were running an ad in the paper that said, we buy, sell, rent houses. And I was getting tons of phone calls because everybody was asking, do you have something at $350 a month, $400 a month? And we didn't. We had single family houses. Our cheapest rent was $800. So we couldn't help these people, but we saw this huge need and we thought we need to step into this. So we decided not to do duplexes nor an apartment building for affordable housing because they had shared walls. Instead, we decided to use mobile homes because they don't have shared walls. And we also decided to sell them with owner financing, which meant they weren't going to be tenants. So the story behind this is um, when we kept getting these phone calls, we decided to do something called a Lonnie deal. And that's named after Lonnie Scruggs. And really what you're doing is you're buying a mobile home in someone's mobile home park and you're buying it for cash. And then you turn around and you sell it on time. So just a real basic thing. And we let everybody we know, everybody in the investor community say, you know, we're, in the, we're looking for mobile homes to buy. If you come across them, then let us know. We let everybody know. And after a couple of weeks, got a call from a friend of ours named Kermit Hopper. And he told me about someone who wanted to lease option his rental. And before that person could move in, he needed to get his mobile home sold and ask if I was interested. So I went to go meet with the... Um, the person who wanted to sell their mobile home. And what you're looking at here, this is known as a T-bar. And we're going to go into a lot more de detail about T-bars in week three of Free Deal School. 
I've got to tell you, this is by far, not even close, the most important document I use in real estate investing. It's a very simple thing. It's just me drawing on a piece of paper, a T, and on the left-hand side, putting down current position, right-hand side, potential position, because I, I, people always ask, how do I know how to structure the deal? And the answer is, the person you're talking to will tell you how to structure the deal. They'll tell you where it hurts. They'll tell you the pain points. We just did that in Kori um, last night. You know, where's the pain points? So in talking to this person in this mobile home, um, I was asking, you know, why would you sell such, such a nice house like this? And they wanted to have Kermit's house. It was a lease option house. And he said, you know, I'm worried someone else is going to get the house. I need to make this deal happen really quick. And he was tired of getting low ball offers because it was a used mobile home and a mobile home park. No lender would lend. And so only someone probably who would want to live in that park, that's who's going to buy it. You can't get a loan for it. So they were given all the money they have, which wasn't much, but the seller saw that as a low ball offer. And also he did not have the $3,000 he needed to give to Kermit as a non-refundable option fee. And the last thing he told me was, listen, if we're able to make a deal, I'm going to need at least 10 days to get moved from my current home over to Kermit's home. So these are the these are his pain points. This is what he told me. The main thing is he wanted that house and he didn't want someone else to take it from him. And so with a T-bar on the left-hand side, I'm just listening to the seller and writing down what they're saying. And as I'm writing it down, I'm looking at the right-hand side saying, I'm not structuring the deal, but I'm thinking to myself, if I can solve these problems, more than likely they're going to accept my offer. So when he says that, you know, he wants to have Kermit's house, he'll be able to get it. He needs the trailer sold fast. I'll be able to close in three days. He doesn't want, uh, he's tired of low ball offers. I can pay full price. So we just were working through the system. You'll see more T-bars in two weeks. But the reason why the T-bar is important is, is because sometimes the why is more important than the how much. And the seller, when I asked, what do you want? He said he wanted $11,400 cash. He said, I will not take a dime less than that. And I said, and I'm thinking to myself, I won't pay a dime more than $5,000 cash. So look at this. Have you ever been in this situation where the seller wants twice as much as you're willing to pay? I mean, we've all been there, right? We've all been in that position where the seller wants more than you're willing to pay. So how do you work that deal? If all you know how to do is a 70 cent on the dollar all cash offer, you can't. This is why what we're doing here over the next six weeks with Deal School and what we're going to be doing at the Ultimate Creative Deal Structuring class is teaching you how to make the impossible deals not just possible, but profitable. So when I'm talking to a person, maybe a seller or buyer, other side of the table, I'm, my definition of negotiation is different from most people. And my definition is I find out what the other side wants. I discover why they want it. That's the T-bar. Then I T-bar it and then I help them get it. So I'm helping them solve their problem. It's not about me taking the house from them. It's not about buying, selling, renting. It's about solving people's real estate problems. Pretty simple. And the T-bar allows you to do that. So I made him a, something called a teeter-totter offer. And this is, to keep it real simple, is a price terms offer. Price terms. More on that in two weeks. But I wanted to give make him a teeter-totter offer to see what he would take. And so the first offer I made him was all cash, $5,000, because that's the most I was willing to spend. But he wanted $11,400. And I said, okay, I'll let you have your price, but I get to name the terms. And in doing the terms, I said, you'll get $11,400, but I'll give it to you in this format. I'll give you $3,000 down. Now, why did I choose a down payment of $3,000? Can y'all put that in the chat? Why $3,000? What had he said that he needed to get into Kermit's house? This is what led me to know what to give him as a down payment. This was really important to me. He had to have the $3,000 to move into the house and he had to have the house sold quickly so it didn't go to somebody else. So I'm putting this together. And I said, I also will give you a note for $8,400, zero interest, $100 a month until paid. 
So this is going to be the format. He'll get the 11 4, but this is what this is the way I'm going to give it to him. And which offer do you think the seller took? I mean, look at that. Which one would you take based if you were in his shoes with his needs? So I gave him exactly what he wanted, what he needed. He was able to get his full price and go around town and bragging to everybody. But I only had two small problems with this deal. The first one was I did not have $3,000. Number two is I had never done a Lonnie deal before. I had done a lot of single family house deals. I'd done a lot of creative structuring, but I never had done a Lonnie deal before. And, you know, have you ever been there? Have you ever not had the money to do a deal? Have you ever not, you know, known how to structure the deal and thinking, what do I do here? This is why you're here tonight. This is why we're doing six weeks of free deal school. This is why Veen and I will be teaching a four-day class about this. It was going to answer these two questions. It's going to help you solve these two problems, which is going to allow you to do a lot more deals moving forward. So I brought in something called an experienced uh, money partner, and we split the deal 50-50. And you're probably thinking to yourself, why would you do that? First of all, how do we come up with that ratio? I just, that was, the, it doesn't have to be 50-50. I chose to use 50-50. And what you're looking at is the commercial note that Kim and I signed that we gave to our private money partner. And as you can see with the down arrow, that's showing where that, our, our um, money partner put the $3,000 up so we could buy this, this mobile home. And then when you're looking at the, the arrow that's pointing up, if you ever wonder how in a note to be able to give up 50% of a property, that said, it's not the property, it's gonna be the income from the property. So that's what that is right there. And so the lender was able to loan, get us, you know, give us the loan of 3,000 and he got 50% of the deal, the net profit from the deal. I'm doing all the work. I found the deal, I'm doing all the work. And um, I, what I got out of it more than anything else is I gained his experience, his know-how and the funds, but the experience and know-how was much more important to me. So this was the exit strategy. This is how we got rid of the home. We sold it for $16,900, but we sold it on time and we got $500 down. We were willing to accept 75 monthly payments at 375. Our interest rate was almost 19%. So a really good return on our money. And the best part is with Lonnie deals, you're in the note business, you're not in the rental business. And we didn't want to be renting mobile homes. And if you are if you come to Ultimate, you'll see this full deal along with a lot more paperwork and what happened after this, this first step and how this deal was done. So why did my money partner do this deal? He didn't, first of all, he didn't have to go find the deal. It was found for him and he didn't have to manage the deal. He's been by this property, by this property one time in his entire life. He was repaid his $3,000 first. We agreed to make him whole. Any profit we made went to him first. So he made his $3,000 and then it was split 50-50 after that. Since doing this deal, he's made over $25,000. Not bad. And he has no risk in this deal because he's made his $3,000 back. So why did Kim and I do this deal? And we learned from doing this with someone who was experienced, we learned how to do Lonnie deals. Very valuable. And Dice Botterford, and that's who we're talking about here, he helped me avoid several expensive mistakes I would have made if he had not been looking over my shoulder. And with this one Lonnie deal, Kim and I went on and we did a lot more Lonnie deals, but it's allowed us to make hundreds of thousands of dollars in the mobile home business. Again, we did a lot more Lonnie deals, but it also allowed us to buy a mobile home park in 2009. And with that mobile home park, we did Lonnie deals throughout that mobile home park. So you can see what we're getting. And you can't look at it about when you're bringing in a, a creative deal partner, you can't look at it from the point of what you're giving up. You should look at it what are you getting? And I think you can see that we got so much more than we ever gave up from doing this deal. So there you're looking at Dyke Spotiford uh, next to me. And then Lonnie Scruggs is next to Kim. And he's the one this man, this deal is named after. 
So I hope that helps out. We're gonna have a good time during the next six weeks of deal school, lots to see and learn. And I'm gonna unshare, and this is back over to you, Vina. Uh, All right, so we are down to about seven minutes before our end time. And I will wrap this up by saying, it was hard for us to come down to four deals. So four, four deal structures. We just we just knew that that was what we were going to have time for. So we had to pick the top four. But we also like the other structures that are out there. Like we we're both doing creative private borrowing. Um, wrap loans are awesome, and we didn't get time to, to to talk about those. Bill is doing a lot of pure option deals right now, where it's an option but without a lease. Uh, land contracts. Um, just had a conversation last night with a guy who's uh, making two offers on properties that involve land contracts. It, it's just, there's just not enough time. And also we, we said we would pick the top ones that we thought were going to be most useful to them. I mean, the, the, the reality is 85 minutes isn't a whole long time, but we do have four days coming up in April, where we're going to break down all of the different structures. Uh, so how each one of them works, like from start to finish, uh, including all the documents, by the way, I've seen some people saying, what do the documents look like in the chat? And uh, they're, they're complex legal documents, but Bill includes all of the ones that he uses in his deed of trust state. I include all the ones that I use in my mortgage state. Guys, if that right there doesn't convince you that you should come to ultimate, I don't know what will. Because if you if you could find an attorney who could draw these up for you, they would cost you way more than it costs to come to this four-day event. We also cover some of the stuff we kind of had to alight over this evening, like how do you actually find sellers who are open to creative deals? How do you talk to them about the deals? What does that process look, look like? Um, how to figure out for each different kind of deal, what kind of terms you can offer. And honestly, we're giving you zero excuses not to come to this. I mean, if you are here, we're going to assume that you really do want to do creative deals. And so spending four days and a little bit of money to learn how to do them all uh, shouldn't be a big leap for you. Uh, it's in Cincinnati. It's April 27, 28, 29, and 30. That's a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. And we're going to be simulcasting the event. So if you're sitting in California going, I can't do that. I can't It'll take me six days to do all the traveling watch it on zoom you you can attend from home uh, matt will be monitoring the zoom so if you have questions you can actually ask them in class uh every single registrant gets all the recordings of the entire event i talked to a guy last night he's like i definitely want to go but i have a wedding that saturday and i said is it yours because if it's not yours i don't know <laughs> i don't understand why you wouldn't be there on saturday and then i said well also, we're recording it and, you know, you'll just get the recordings afterwards. Uh, we are in an early bird registration period right now. After April 12th, it goes to the full price, which is $15.97 for one person and $18.97 if you want to bring a spouse, family member, or business partner. Uh, that's that's what, honestly what the price should be right now. Where have you seen four day live seminars with 300 page manuals and all the contracts and nothing else to buy at that kind of price in the last 10 years? Right now it's $12.97 for one or $15.97 for two, but we're giving travel allowances to people who want to come and join us live. This ought to pay for your plane ticket one of your nights at the hotel. Uh, it's $9.97 for one, $12.97 with a spouse or family member or actual legitimate business partner. But this is the last time y'all are going to hear this offer, okay? We, we've, got a, we've got a special, like, just go ahead and pull the trigger because it's going to be great. And if it's not great, you're going to get your money back anyway. So who cares? This is open until... Five o'clock tomorrow night, just to give the, the people who are going to be listening to the recordings a chance, go to billandkimcook.com, 
select the registering button that's 997, that's the in-person button, use the coupon code CDS897. You have to use CDS897, write that down, CDS897. And you will save another $100. You get to come to all four days or the Zoom meeting for $8.97 for one person or $11.97 for two people. Now, that, that means that even the people who are joining us on Zoom are getting the travel allowance, but we couldn't figure out how to do the complicated math of, oh, deduct $100 from either one. So particularly if you're thinking you're going to attend the simulcast, uh, you want to register tonight at billandkimcook.com and using the coupon code CDS897. If you wait until after five o'clock tomorrow, it's going to be 997. And then it's only that for another 10 days after that. So seriously, you can ask the folks who are here who have been to Ultimate. Some of them have been there every year that we have taught it, like 2020, 2021, 2022. And they will tell you it is the best creative finance class out there because it's real. It's taught by people who have over 60 years worth of experience. We've seen all the pitfalls. We've fallen into some of the pits and we can tell you how to, how to not do that. Um, it's incredibly inexpensive. As I'm looking at the slide, I'm going, Bill, we need to rediscuss what the price should be because it should be a lot more than this. And uh, you will get all the forms, contracts, and the weekly support calls to make sure that you can actually structure deals once you leave the class. If you happen to be a previous attendee, don't sign up at eight ninety seven. Your your price is is like four ninety seven or something. Bill uh, Kim sent you an email months ago telling you about the coupon code for that was. So we are at 826, which is a minute later than we need, meant to be, and we still need to draw for the door prize. So Matthew, have you run, we've got, a, we've got a thing where you can enter all the names and it randomly picks one. Have you done that already, I hope? Yes. So yeah, the, 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 winner, the winner has to be here. So if you hear your name, you got to speak up. You're going to get a complete online course and manual called how to do subject twos legally, ethically, and profitably. And the winner is Matthew. I don't have the you Jeannie got... Bryant. Is she Jean... here? Jeannie Bryant. If you are here, you better speak up. Can she speak up? Can she unmute? Well, I'm I'm gonna look at the participants list and is it J Jeannie with a J or Yes with a J. She's here. Well, she's here, but she needs to speak up so we know she's actually here here. If not, I picked a backup. Jeannie. Pick the backup. Can she press <laughs> her uh, space bar? <laughs> well, she could even she could even Raise your hand. In. Raise your oh, hand. You'll come oh, to wait. the top. Bev, are they are they all muted? Yes. <laughs> I allowed her to unmute, however. Hello. Raise, raise your hand and you'll come to the very forefront. Jeannie. Nope. Okay. Next. <laughs> okay. Did you did you? I asked you to draw three names in case this happened. Yes. Daniela Heston. Daniela. Daniela. I'm here. Hold on. Ah. <laughs> and we I was like, no way, it's me, and I'm gonna have tech issues, you know. <laughs> and we have a winner. Okay, so um, Bev, I believe you already have Daniela's email address because she's a Cincinnati RIA member. Can yeah. you make sure she gets the link tomorrow? Sure. For the subject two class? Yes. Congratulations, Daniela. And we will be doing a drawing. We will be doing a drawing at the end of every session for different courses. So make sure that you stay aboard until the very end. 
And next week, we're going to talk about what can I offer on a creative deal? And we got to get out of here so that we can move over to the support call, sign up for ultimate deal structuring tonight. Uh, again, let me back up and show you it's billandkimcook.com 897. If you sign up tonight with the coupon code CDS 897, we will see you all next week. Everybody have a great week. Happy investing. Love Bye. you guys. Thank you, Vina.